All right. Thanks, uh, guys. Uh, thanks also for the organization to uh, invite me here. I think it's for me it's really excited, but uh, because uh, usually I always talk with clinicians and scientists uh, that do not do computational biology and systems medicine. So, um, and I would like to be a pro bit provocative, maybe a bit more provocative than the other speakers even. Um, so just to explain, I'm my, my name is Tim. I'm a rheumatologist by training, and I came to Utrecht University three years ago because I wanted to change healthcare. Uh, and I got the opportunity to do so. Uh, so I'm also director of the Laboratory of Translation and Immunology. And before I came, the idea was to put all the immunologists together. So we had, before I came, 12 locations of immunology. And now we put everything together and we have a, a total lab of about 250 FTEs uh, on immunology. So I always have to, sli to show this uh, disclosure slide, and I think it also g becomes aware that we work a lot with uh, pharmaceutical industries. And I will tell you a little bit more why that is. Um, okay, so what I'm going to work with is what's the ideal world and how do we get there? And I think that it's a very simple actually as a clinician that we want to know who to treat with what, when, and for how long. And none of these questions we can answer at this moment. Um, because what happens usually in the daily medicine is that, especially in rheumatology, we use coincidental observations. So I that's the, m the most of our therapies come from other disciplines. That doesn't necessarily say that they are not effective, but none of these uh, medicine work for longer than a couple of years or uh, get y you know cure the disease. That's really far from being uh, where we are. Uh, there's one exception that will go into that. Um, and, and I think really, uh, we talked about this for a long time this morning and some of the speakers will agree with me, is that we have to get rid of a diagnosis. Uh, and I don't mean as a doctor that, we, that it's important to have a diagnosis if you see a patient and you have to explain to the patient what he or she has, but if you want to start therapy, diagnosis doesn't make any sense anymore. And I will show you why. Uh, and this is also what Mike said this morning. I mean, 90% of our treatments fill over 60% of our patients. So it's just very simple. We're not doing a great job. Um, and I think what is really interesting, so the World Health Organization had a recent statement that roughly 50% of us die because of fibrosis. And fibrosis is a uh, mechanism that's usually uh, induced by inflammation. So where are we looking at? Um, and then I think that something that we didn't discuss today is really a recent paper in Nature about the irreproducibility of results. And there were, uh, two years ago, there was a nice paper of Amgen that tried to repeat 64 uh, studies and failed in except one to replicate what's in the literature. And we spent a lot of time in our lab to, to, to increase reproducibilities, and we'll show a little bit about that. Um, so it's not only in, in your daily uh, lab business, but also in clinical trials. And I think this is the really nicest slide that I have today, because this is a year ago, the ophthalmologist came to me. Uh, so, so I'm actually having uh, all kinds of inflammatory disciplines. So the ophthalmology, dermatology, IBD, and, and then the uh, rheumatology, of course. And they said, well, we want to have a look at uveitis and we, uh, we treat all the patients the same. And they showed me this slide, but this slide is just not one diagnosis, right? Or, or don't, don't, do we disagree with that? I don't see a lot of, uh, so I will go into that later also in my talk. Um, so today's aim is, I think, why do we fail in medicine? Um, how do we deal with complexity in immunology? I think that's actually the step up stone to, to be become more effective, uh, explain systems medicine. I, I know what I want to do is some examples because the biggest problem we have is I think to go from a population based strategy to an individual uh, based strategy. And everybody talks about personalized medicine, but nobody's doing it. Um, and then the future, how, how would I see where to go? So as I said before, this is the biggest problem we have. Uh, so there's inflammation somewhere in time, and that leads up to fibrosis. And I just showed you that that's uh, about largely the mortality that we have in clinics. It's even far more than cancer, and still everybody's talking about cancer. Uh, and then there's a complex uh, orchestra of aging and senescence, and something leads to repair, and we don't know, really know where that's going. And then we have genetics and environment. And I'm going to talk a little bit about systemic sclerosis, uh, which is a very bad disease. But it's also a disease where the environmental factors are really clear. Uh, I will show you a little, a little bit later about that. 
So this is, uh, t I was in New York two weeks ago, and this is the uh, tube map of New York. And I thought, well, this is actually exemplifying what we're usually doing. Because if you want to know f how to go from this to this, you really need to show see the whole map. But what people doing is the reductionists, they're really looking at a very, very limited amount of what's on the map. And I'm not saying that the reductionist research didn't bring us anything. I mean, if you're still if you interested in IL-17 receptors, you should do that. But if you really want to understand disease in a spatial and temporal manner, you're not going to get there. So this is a very simplified scheme, uh, which you all know about immunology. And um, we started to think about the fact that if you really want to understand disease, then you have to look at everything that's on the slide. Um, and that's what I'm going to show you. So three years ago, we started uh, what we now call systems medicine. And here you see the outpatient clinic. So here there are the various diagnoses. And of course, we have to start with diagnosis because that's general medicine nowadays. Um, and the overall aim would be to have every single patient with an inflammatory disease in here. And for some of these we have an imaging core because clinical stratification is really important if you want to make the change. And then we take out cell subsets. Sorry, I can even better explain that. So we take out different cell subsets. We do an extensive flow cytometry. We even do site of now. So we can really characterize these cell subsets. And usually we take uh, these cell subsets, including NK and NK cells. And desirably, we can do stimulatome analysis. But uh, usually we go into RNA-seq and histone landscapes and etc. Et et and then, of course, the, um, the microbiome is becoming very interesting. Um, and I think then we have IBD where we have the gut microbiome, we, I will show you some cohorts where we look at psoriasis where we have the skin uh, microbiome, but also in the eye we have the uh, a microbiome of the anterior eye chamber. Um, and then of course it starts to be very interesting to see how can we uh, uh, by how can we connect all these dots. And then we measure some things in the circulation, uh, I think just that's more purpose of biomarkers. So the big, the big challenge, and that's why our is our group now, is to really how to integrate all these layers. Um, and that's why we work also with Jasper's group, and, def um, and we start to work with many more people. And I think if you have all of this, then, then you can start to think about precision medicine. Uh, and I actually like to call that uh, cause-directive therapy, but what you actually are looking is what's wrong in that particular patient and then start the treatment. And I should say that uh, five years ago, if you said that to industry, then, then that wouldn't make any sense because they didn't have a lot of antibodies and so on and so on. But now actually I'm being challenged at a weekly basis by the global headquarters to say, well, Tim, if you have a target for that disease, we have an antibody for that. And, um, and I, I know quite some pipelines uh, and there are lots of things coming at us. It's actually very interesting that 90% of the pipelines of every industry is really similar. Uh, so that, that's because they all use the same thing that the screening techniques that don't have anything to do with clinics. Um, so it's actually more interesting to see that the unique things per industry, what they are going to do. I mean, every single industry has BTK inhibitors, for example, and they all say we have the biggest, the best, and the most specific. Um, so this is exactly essentially what we do. So we take 80 ml of blood of every single patient, and we take all the cells out. But this is something really interesting. So we also did a lot of investigative technology. Is what's, what's the real uh, relevance of having serum in the fridge? And I mean, I, I was very disappointed in our own lab to measure cytokines in circulation, so in serum or plasma. And if you do then the uh, kind of uh, secrecy, the same measurement twice. Um, and we found out we did a lot of we spent a lot of time on that. If you keep serum in the fridge for more than two years, you can better throw it away. And I know by practice that I was in my previous hospital that uh, I came past to a refrigerator that smelled very badly and then it out appeared to be that it was out of power for two weeks and the, the fungi were coming out of that and my boss said well no we have to keep the samples and still measure it because it's such an amazing cohort but that's how crap comes into the literature uh, so that's part of the reproducibility and so we started to work on uh, dry blood spots for example which is interesting because it's very doable for a patient at home actually so for clinical trial purposes you patient can do this at home can put one drop of blood on a piece of paper can put it on the desk for a week and then bring it to the lab and the reproducibility is more than 95 percent for every single cytokine we measure it and we measured roughly 300 and you can measure 300 cytokines on half of this drop of blood and now we are also measuring microRNAs and so on and so on so it's it's something that we have to think about that crap in is crap out and that's often forgotten in these uh, in these analysis 
Um, so of course we, we cannot do this on our own. And I think we talked about patient care in clinical departments. So um, I will show you that we now have 24,000 patients with an inflammatory disease uh, and we need to carefully uh, clinically phenotype those. Um, and that's, that's where the electronic patient file comes in. And that's, gonna, that's a very bad discussion in the Netherlands. But even said so, clinicians are really bad. Uh, because if you just take one measurement, and I think you said it before this morning, I think if you look at rheumatology and you look at the disease activity score, about more than 80% have a different spot where they put it in the electronic patient file. And only 5% put it right at the right spot where you can find it. So we have a lot of free text mining uh, procedures going on. But what's equally important is what drug did the patient use that day? Because if you're going to look at methylation profiles, you want to know what those, whatever the patient used. Um, so that's now in order. Uh, and then we have the, all the things that I showed you before, and that's uh, finally leading to a uh, computational analysis and hopefully precision medicine. Um, so this is what happens. So these are this is now the laboratory. So we put two big pillars of immunologists, about 250, and um, we all talk to each other. That's actually quite brilliant. I'm not sure how we do that, but we know what everybody's doing quite well. And these are just an example of the, the patients we see. So in the rheumatology department, we see quite a big cohort of uh, prospectively followed, well-documented patients. And um, I can show you that more than 10 patients per group is already enough if you do systems medicine to get really interesting results. Um, so what the idea would be actually is to have about the first 50 patients of every, of every diagnosis into the systems medicine approach and I will show you some of the data. And what I also show you is that it becomes very interesting if you start to compare these diseases um, and then you see that diagnosis doesn't make any sense, therapy-wise. Um, but we have also other diseases, and I will show you why looking at uveitis becomes very interesting if you look at all the other diseases that also have uveitis as well as a kind of comorbidity. Um, and also what's an interesting phenomenon is what we do really well in the clinic is that this is juvenile idiopathic arthritis. So if this patient becomes 18 years of age, it comes to my outpatient clinics and I call it a rheumatoid arthritis and I treat it that way. But interestingly, we talked about S1 and A this morning, MRP814. MRP814 levels are soaringly high in these individuals, but they are absent here, which is already stating. Uh, should I go a little bit in move? All right, so let's stay. Sorry. <laughs> which means that it doesn't make any sense to, to just say, well, you know, age determines whether a diagnosis changed, yes or no. That's a really bad example. Um, okay, so, so where are we and why did we start this? Um, and I have to go to one disease. I know you're, you're not clinicians, but I think this is really important to understand what actually happens on our patient clinics. Um, so imagine that, you, well, you won't imagine that you have breast cancer, but imagine an oncologist that feels a breast tumor and says, well, this is Herceptin and this is another drug. And that's what we do in clinics. So scleroderma, we stratify on the basis of diffuse and limited based on feeling. So we feel the skin and we say, if there's no fibrosis up to the elbows, it's a limited disease, whereas if that's the case, then we call it diffuse scleroderma. And you can have the discussion, is this just uh, two ends of a spectrum or are they really do different diseases? And I can tell you that I see really a lot of scleroderma patients. I only see scleroderma patients. In fact, and if I put 100 of my patients, they're all really different. And all the clinicians would say that, but that's not true, because if you have rheumatoid, all rheumatoid patients have always the same joints affected. So there's some homogeneity there, but in scleroderma, it's not the case. So then it becomes interesting to see that there is actually a correlation with the presence of antibodies. Because the anthocyanotomeric antibodies always are present and limited, if there, but never in diffuse. So then you start to have discussion, is this not really two different diseases? Um, the good thing about scleroderma, actually, that's the next slide, sorry. Uh, so what about this? There's time dependency here, that's really important. Uh, and, and I will show you later in the slide. But here you always start with vascular abnormalities. Uh, which is the white fingers, digital ulcers, and 20% of the females in this room, they have Renault's phenomenon, which is the white finger thing, I will show you later. And then somehow in time, somewhere in time, develops out uh, immunity. And I try to not to mention autoimmunity, because I don't think that exists here. Um, and then we have fibrosis, somehow. Uh, but but she, I will show you here, is that um, the lucky thing so we have is that we can start to look in individuals that might have a risk to get scleroderma. So here you have a white fingers. This is a Renault's phenomenon. Um, that is occurring in about 20% of the females if you ask for it. 
but 0.01% of those individuals will get scleroderma, so it's a very, very low risk. Then in the second phase, uh, some of these individuals become antibody positive. Still an 0.1% chance of getting scleroderma, very low. And then we have what we call puffy fingers or nail fold lesions. So this is what you see if you put the nails under a microscope. And you can see that there's the, the vessel disformation and bleedings. And these patients, they have 85% of getting scleroderma. So these individuals are at risk. And it would be really the holy grail if we would be able to identify those individuals and start treatment before they get fibrosis, because fibrosis is seen as an irreversible process. Um, so that's where we are. And we thought, you know, this, this should be a multi-hit model. Either there's a one target that, that is there for a couple of times, or there are different hits uh, as the same as is in cancer. Um, so we started to do that. And I must say that I also started this approach because I was very disappointed about our genome-wide studies. I mean, I've spent several PhD students honestly uh, finding out what the real role of uh, CD3 Zeta is. And we are still busy with STAT4. And um, I can say that this is a pain in the ass, but we have some really interesting results, but that's after five or six years. And I'm still not sure whether this is something to do with the GWAS. I think GWAS studies just show us direction in what pathways to look, because all the genes here are in the L12 pathway. Um, and I think what's also the problem with the GWAS, if that, that's a single layer you look at, is that the power here is too low. But these are interesting targets, really interesting. Uh, and we're always forgetting these. I think um, f uh, psychologically it's actually a very funny thing is that we always uh, replicate positive findings but in fact this is a false negative maybe and we never replicate them. So there's always bias towards what's probably the best uh, and we always try to forget these things. And that's also what the systems medicine does, you mean you, you will look at these uh, possible pathways in another way, looking at other omics layers. Um, so what what did bring us? I mean, this is just a comparison. So here we looked whether genes would uh, distinguish between the antibodies or at the, the things that I do as a rheumatologist, deciphering limited versus diffuse disease. And here you can look at the non-HLA genes and you see that doesn't really matter. So overall, where we are uh, looking at uh, 12,000 patients, which is really a worldwide effort, uh, there are more than 200 studies now on SNPs and scleroderma, and the odds ratio is usually 1.4, which means that I had a 0.4 more percent chance uh, of getting whatever you odds ratio is pointing at. And then the problem is that every single disease has the same SNPs at the moment. So STAT4 is all over the place, IRF5 is all over the place. And so no, there's no clinical relevance of this. I cannot ever deal with this in clinics. So we have to do better. Um, okay, so then Scleroderma, Sjogren's, lupus, they are all type 1 interferon diseases. So that means that plasmasoid dendritic cells should play a big role because that's the cell that makes this cytokine. So we went to the thing, okay, let's go for dendritic cells. And I don't have to tell this, but dendritic cells are the generals of the disease uh, uh, immune system. And we did a very simple experiment uh, just by looking at the numbers of plasmasoid dendritic cells. But we made one very interesting uh, decision. So we looked at limited and they diffuse disease, but also at those ones that had a very early onset disease. And that's why it's important to have clinicians, I think. Because if you look at these individuals, they have fibrosis. That's the typical thought that we always see patients only with fibrosis. But if you look early, these ones, they have no fibrotic signs, they have inflammation. They have puffy fingers and that's really inflammation. So and here you can see, and you don't have to be a rocket scientist, that these are way more of these cells. That are the cells that make type 1 interferon, and here and here, but this is kind of a gradient. But then if you then start to realize that this is probably the same patient there, the only difference is time, uh, then it becomes very interesting. Although some of these will die within one year, unfortunately, but still the majority will end up in the late diffuse. So what's going on? And we thought we had the answer because we had plasmasoid dendritic cells and we thought we have type 1 interferon, but we measured this in 23, 23 ways, but we didn't find any. And remember, these cells are one hour freshly isolated, non-stimulated cells. And I made one big mistake, and that's also showing that mistakes are really necessary in science. So I didn't add buffer. And I found that in we always blinded, and we always did two individuals per subset. So we had always seven or eight individuals, and I found that there were always two individuals that had a completely turned yellow medium. Um, and so we thought, well, you know, let's do a, a non-hypothesis-driven approach. So we measured uh, the proteome of these cells. And in this case, there are seven individuals of one experiment, 
and you can see that uh, the proteome of these cells that have an early diffuse disease are, is really completely different. And I can show you a kilometer of paper of the rest of the proteome, which is really flat. And then again, interestingly enough, you see a couple of dots here, that is the t time difference. There are a little bit of these proteins, but they are not anymore in limited and healthy controls. Um, so, and I think what, what didn't come up today is that we have to replicate biologically, technically, and in numbers, the findings that we have. We didn't discuss that, um, because that's also to do with reproducibility. So we found CXL4, and we did lots of experiments uh, by measuring all kinds of ways of CXL4. And then for a clinician, it's important to show that if you have uh, high levels of CXL4, you do worse. So these patients have more uh, lung fibrosis if you have high levels, and these patients have more pulmonary hypertension. And if you have pulmonary hypertension, you die within one and a half years. So it's really bad if you have high levels of CXL4. We also measured this prospectively. So this is a baseline sample, the perfect thing of a biomarker in the serum. And you can see this is falling away. So this is low and high CXL4, and the same is here. That all the patients with high CXL4, almost except two, they were really bad in the decline of uh, pulmonary function, and they all had progressive skin disease. Whereas all the others from the literature didn't see this correlation. And I think then uh, we you have to get proof of concept. Uh, so we did some experiments where we put... Um, we stimulated endothelial cells to, to see whether they made uh, CXL4. Uh, we, we did some other experiments and, and we built a mouse model. So this is a mouse model where we injected CXL4 for seven days under the skin. And you can see that there is a huge thickening of the skin. Um, there are multiple immune cells. But what's even more important in the skin, there is the specifically uh, correlating with what you see in patients. So all the genes that you see here that are upregulated are specifically similar to what we see in patients. So that's the closest we can get, I guess, with models. Um, so where are we? I mean, we have lots of PDCs. Interestingly, these two individuals, they had stem cell transplantation. So clinically, they were in remission, but they had huge um, amounts of CXO4 if you compare with controls, as well as PDCs. So that's also one of the things that we thought, you know, although you give an autologous stem cell transplantation, um, you buy precious time for this patient, but the disease is not gone. And this also shows you that it takes probably six to seven years to really get full circle again. So you might have CXL4, but uh, you need other hits again to get scleroderma, because these individuals, they had a disease for their five or seven years respectively. So, and then, then we did a lot of things. We, we did also staining of the skin. We showed that CXL4 is really specifically high in the skin of scleroderma patients. But then we had a big question mark. So how does it really drive disease? And I wish that we had the models that you showed today uh, when we were there. Uh, so wha what about, um, can we do more than genetics, right? I mean, that, that is actually very simple because if you compare species, then this is the case. But if you look into the species, we, we are very much alike. So it's actually almost impossible that differences between us are uh, explained by SNPs. Um, so we, you know all of this, so we, we went into this, we went to into all the other layers of uh, regulation of the genes and how this occurs to scleroderma. And I think this is a very nice example. I mean, this is the, the nature's best example of phenotype switch. And uh, we, we started to talk about, well, maybe this happens also in scleroderma, if you really look time-wise and if you look at what is dysregulated in these individuals. And then we had the uh, observation that we had a lot of these plasmasoid dendritic cells. And PDCs are really difficult. I mean, they don't have a B cell receptor or a T cell receptor that might enable you to look at receptor rearrangement. So we thought, well, if you want to have some idea about proliferation, then we might look at aging. And uh, I'm not sure if you're all aware about aging, but this is happening in all disease. So this means that your telomere gets shorter, faster in time. If you live in Glasgow, it, you, you are like this. And if you go outside Glasgow, you're normalizing. That's, that's, not a, that's not a joke, actually. That's a really bad situation. Um, so this is just normal disease. And this means that your telomere repair is just not fast enough. But when we looked at diffuse disease, then we saw something very interesting. So again, these are individuals that have a disease just for one year. And just that thi this made us suggest that something happens far before that we see a clinical diagnosis. And actually, there's only one disease that has this, which is progeria. And uh, if I'd had outpatient clinics the day that we had this data, and in fact, patients with scleroderma look very much alike progeria because they are older, but they have shiny vessels, they have subcutaneous fat loss and everything else. Um, so then we got the very interesting thing that we have all the cells from these patients. So that's actually why I'm saying now, if we did all the things that I've showed you on full blood samples, we wouldn't found anything. 
So I'm a real fan of looking at cell subs, also because you're not sick because of 70% of your T-cells. You're sick because you have a very small cell population that goes RE, or maybe several cell subsets, but still small in size. So we were able to really look at uh, these the cells that we have isolated and to see what, what, where in which cells is the uh, telomere shortest and does it make a difference if you look at limited or diffuse disease. And here you can see, for example, that in diffuse disease, PDCs are very much aged, but in myeloid dendritic cells it's the case more or less more in, in limited and some disease, both of these cells, and in some uh, monocytes you don't see anything actually. Which is interesting because monocytes didn't enter, of course, because they're circulating any tissues. Um, so, and then we actually had also an another interesting thing is that we had monozygotic twins of scleroderma patients and then something really interesting happens because if you have uh, asthma probably also, but also for rheumatoid, the concordance rate is really high. So if you are monozygotic twins, there's about an 80% chance to get the disease. But in scleroderma it's not. So the twin has only 4% chance of getting the disease. And then it's so you always know that, almost always know that the diseased twin has a healthy control which has the same DNA. And then you see something interesting happening. So in the limited, you see that the affected twin has a shorter telomere, uh, but the, the other one is normal. But in the diffuse one, both of them already have a very shortened telomere, and this will never become a scleroderma patients. So that's an interesting concept. And we are now doing single cell analysis of all these twins with se several different f uh, cells to see, because what I think that you see here is that the pathways that you miss to protect you against scleroderma, whereas if the, uh, in, the, in the core that I showed you before is that the things that you need to get scleroderma. So if we are able to combine these two um, cohorts, then I think we understand scleroderma. Um, and, and what is also interesting, then the computational modeling comes in, to can we predict a model based on the downstream pathways or upstream pathways that make you age? Can we then say, is there a difference between diffuse and, and limited? And just don't look at these ones, but if you see that there's a model coming out of those 30 genes, and with that model we can predict about 95% accuracy wh whether you have limited or diffuse disease. So in fact, I think for the first time we show that the molecularly there are different diseases. And if you look at limited, you see that there's a telomere repair problem, whereas if you look in diffuse, then you see that there's DNA damage control. And we know that patients with scleroderma, they have a problem to deal with hypoxia, and then I come back to the Raynaud's phenomenon, because one of the genes that pops up in this RNA-seq has everything to do with hypoxia. So the small white fingers, if you systemic hypoxic levels, uh, which probably the patients cannot deal with. So this is just another example. This is a sequencing data of the PDCs. And uh, what I just wanted to show here, you have this group. So this is a healthy woman with Raynaud's. This is a healthy woman with Raynaud's and ANA. And then we have preclinical scleroderma and then the definite. And then you see that some of these genes suddenly pop up uh, in a very preclinical stage. Uh, again, these have a very small chance to get scleroderma. We had a couple of outliers and in fact this one has scleroderma now. Uh, so I thought already kind of proof of concept. This is another gene and you see that here it is normal compared to the other one, but then suddenly here it pops up. Again, suggesting that there is a multi-hit model that changes over time. So if you're ta talking about disease evolution, then it becomes very complicated. Uh, and so this is where we are at the moment. So this is, we've done quite a lot of things. Um, and I think that this is just an example to show you that we have a multi-hit model. Over time, different things happen in these individuals. And I think it's just uh, very interesting to, to see whether we can find the, the very last hit that uh, is going to happen in this patient, which makes them going into scleroderma. And it's relevant because in one of these individuals that I showed you, there was a truck driver. He was perfectly healthy, 36 years of age, and he had a truck accident and he had a chlorine gas inhalation. And then three months later, he needed stem cell therapy. So in that particular patient, he had very short telomeres, which you cannot have in three months. So there's that patient was not the cause of disease. It's just the final uh, drop that filled the bucket in this, this individual. So we have to be careful and find it out. Um, well, this is something I don't have to tell you because everybody said that before. I, I really much like um, the Kazim thing and, and that finally we, we are able to break through and change people's minds. But this is what happens. So um, I, I cannot show. So these are the three different diseases. Uh, lupus um, is quite well known for the involvement of PDCs. It's a different disease. I won't explain you all of that, but the role of PDCs is really to find these nets and then start to make type 1 interferon very clearly. 
So that's completely different as the thing that I showed you for sclerodema. And then we have Sjogren's and we don't know anything about the involvement of, scler or of PVCs. So, but still, the companies say, well, you know, this is a type 1 interferon disease, so you can treat those patients with anti-type 1 interferon antibodies. Um, and th this is only working in a very small number of lupus patients, but uh, it's not really successful in the other ones. Um, so that doesn't work. And I think where we are at the moment is that we know that PDCs are important, but again, the, up, the up, down or upstream reasons for that molecularly are completely distinct. Uh, and I think we are even going this way, is that we now might have maybe, let's say, 10 dominant pathways in scleroderma, which might be really, really the same in, in a small subset of diagnosed patients with another diagnosed. And then you start to be really interesting to say, okay, maybe we shouldn't look at diagnosis, but really at the molecular patterns and start to give these individuals all the same treatment, hitting molecular dysregulation. Um, so just to give you a, a couple of examples of how we disbehave in clinics. So this is Sjogren's, and Sjogren's is typical. I mean, there's a patient coming in, dry, mite, dry, dry mouth, dry eyes, uh, tired, uh, lots of other complaints, and it has autoantibodies specific for Sjogren's. Then this is what we call primary Sjogren's syndrome. We do a lip biopsy and we count B cells. Very stupid, but we do it. Um, then if we don't count enough B cells, then we say, well, you have non sjogren sicker and we send you home. But you have the same complaints, it's uh, literally the same person uh, sitting in front of me. So we said, okay, let's just do an, uh, a very nice exercise. And we did RNA sequencing of PDCs and microRNA profiling. And then we did the same thing because people are not going to believe us for myeloid dendritic cells. And I can tell you that for the RNA, for let's say at least for the microRNA, there's about 98% similarity between the, those groups. So we're just simply saying that we don't do a good job there. These people need therapies similarly like these PSS patients. Um, but still, we, we are very stubborn and still do this. And that one, what I'm trying to say here is that, I mean, nobody ever looked in those tissues what the B cell actually does molecularly or what the T cell does molecularly. We just simply count B cells. So this is also an example. So as a rheumatologist, I see um, um, rheumatoid arthritis, which is 1% of the population. Um, then I see now psoriasis. And about 3 to 40% of these patients will get psoriatic arthritis, which is really dis distinct from these ones. If, if I would put two patients here, you could make the difference really clearly. That's absolutely a distinct disease. Um, about 40 to 70% of these patients have IBD. If you take biopsies of these, then they have IBD. Um, these patients and these patients have uveitis. And funny enough, you have one uh, form of uveitis, which is called birdshot chiroiuretinopathy, which is associated with HLA A29 and ERB1. And this is uh, B27 and ERB2. So two SNPs make a totally different phenotype, which I think very interesting. Um, and we put everything together. So now we have a prospective cohort of psoriasis patients because I want to know what happens if this one becomes this one, and we have enclosing spondylitis as a control, then uveitis, GIA, and inflammatory disease, and rheumatoid, all in one cohort. And we do all the same things that I just showed you, taking all the cells and everything else, um, and then do all the omics layers, let's say. So this is how that, uh, that cohort looks like. We now have uh, psoriasis, so about, uh, let's say, 20% of those will get PSA. Then we have a control, we have novel PSA patients. And this is what they call, which is really hot at the moment, disease interception. So if you are able to identify that person that goes from a psoriasis to a PSA at a day or one in, within one week that it goes there, you will have a window of opportunity, like in rheumatoid. So if you treat that individual, you probably can do m way better than if you do it after two to three years. All clinical trials in this disorder are now with three to four year old patients. And we know in rheumatoid that you are too late to do something really well. So, and then of course, it's interesting to know um, what happened epigenetically in these individuals. Because one example, this patient has a very low risk of cardiovascular disease, but this patient dies 10 years earlier because of cardiovascular risk. So it's not only that this has arthritis or not, it's a completely different disease. Um, okay, so what I said to you is that I think systems medicine can do a lot. Um, biomarker discovery is an interesting thing, um, but truly understand complex disease is something else. And I, I'm not, we are not there by far, but we 
have way more chance of getting there doing everything what we said and i think another very interesting concept is mode of action and i think we discussed this also this morning for the fda and emea is that um if if i was a scleroderma patient and i knew what i know and uh, i would say okay there are about 20 possible pathways important in scleroderma although i don't care about what they do but if i would take a new drug and those let's say 20 or 30 percent of those targets doesn't change within two weeks i would stop a trial what we now do is we, we give patients cyclophosphamide, which is chemotherapy, sublethal dose, uh, and I have to treat a year and then tell a patient, well, I did something good or I didn't, uh, which I don't think is really good medicine. Uh, stem cell transportation we do, but it kills one in 10 patients. And I can tell you that's a different, that's a difficult story in my, in my room to tell a woman with two small children of 34 years of age that she has a chance of 10% to die because of me. So what we do now is we have a lot of industry uh, collaboration where we look at proof of mechanism trials. So new targets that either come from our pipeline or from them and start to look at what really changes in these new uh, medicine. Because if you find, let's say, 10 targets, 10 markers in that particular medicine, you can do a phase two or three trial and say to them, hey, you have to take those markers into account and forget about the uh, clinical endpoints because most of the diseases are really difficult to get endpoints. Um, and you can say maybe after one year you have to prove that but I mean if that is proven you can say we do a clinical trial for four weeks and then decide on whether it's effective or not um, well I, this is what I showed you I think that uh, this is just an example I mean we are now also comparing lupus versus Sjogren's versus scleroderma uh, with all these uh, layers that we currently detecting um, and I think what's also important that you should remember that you should also try to do these confirmatory assays and it's really important to bring something to a preclinical developmental pathway. Um, well, what I said, I think that uh, uh, that's what I see around me is that we have a really unique set of patients. I think having 24,000 patients with an inflammatory disease is nobody has that. Uh, and we are really busy of getting uh, all those patients into the clinical uh, in systems medicine um, and uh, what is all very clear to you I think that in the European Commission that's a really clear drive to go to systems medicine if you read the new roadmaps that I was involved in that's really interesting so if anybody has an interest in, in working in our in our lab uh, you are welcome to talk with us uh, Riedemann is here uh, more longer than I am um, but I think we're getting somewhere um, well, this is the talk. This is the group. This is an old picture. So now we have uh, roughly 50 people working on uh, systems medicine, uh, doing various things. And um, as f everybody of you, I mean, we, we are heavily reliable on people that understand models. And I was really happy to see that uh, you can talk for two hours about modeling, uh, which something for me is totally new. So happy to take questions.